Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for our workshop, Exploring Vector Search in Rockset. My name is Ashley, and I run events here at Rockset. I want to share a couple of housekeeping items before we kick things off. This workshop is recorded and will be shared with you in the next few days. This is an interactive workshop, so please utilize the Q&A feature at any time to ask questions or to keep things interactive, feel free to unmute yourself and chime in with questions as well. With that, I will go ahead and pass things to Sophia, our presenter today. All right, thank you, Ashley. Hello, everyone. My name is Sophia. Good morning. Thank you for joining me at our Vector Search Workshop. My name is Sofia Kovčević, and I work in product and engineering here at Rockset. I'm joined today by one of our wonderful product managers, John Solitario. John Solitario, if you want to say hi quickly. Hey, everyone. He led the production of Vector Search at Rockset, and together we are both very excited to present on Vector Search and Rockset, a stepping stone into real-time machine learning. In the next hour, we will explore the concept of Vector Search, dive deep into the mathematical principles behind it, understand its significance across different applications, and collaborate together on a practical example using IMDB movie data. So let's get right into it and delve into the fascinating world of Vector Search. And I encourage anyone to turn on their cameras. Feel free to interrupt me throughout this process. I'd love that, I'd love for this to be a discussion. All right, so let's start with the agenda. Today we'll be answering the following questions. What is vector search? What problem does it solve? How does vector search work? From vector embedding to nearest neighbors, why do we need vector search and five common use cases? And how can I start using vector search in Rockset today? And this will include a hands-on workshop with IMDB movie data. So let's, let's jump into what is vector search. So vector search is a method for efficiently finding and retrieving similar items from a large data set based on their vector representations. These items can be anything, documents, images, sounds, et cetera. And a vector embedding algorithm is used to compact the unstructured data into a vector of numbers that is more easily understood and manipulated by machine learning models or whatever models you're applying. And once we have these numerical vectors, we calculate the distance between the vectors and then determine which vectors are most similar. Now, definitions are fun and all, but I learn from example. So what does this all mean? Let me try to share what this means with a 2D example. So let's, let's take movie data, for example. We have comedy on the x-axis and action on the y, and we have four dots currently on the graph. So let's say this yellow dot here is Beverly Hills Cop. It's both comedic and it has a lot of action. So those are two features that we're representing this data with. So you can put a numerical value on how comedic it is, and you can put a numerical value on how, how much action there is, and now you have a coordinate, X and Y. Let's say something that's high action, not very funny, is John Wick. And we have some that's funny, but not much action. That's Weekend on Bernie's. And then what's something that doesn't have any action or any comedy? And that's every Hallmark Christmas movie ever, all the way to the bottom. Now, what if I have another movie, Deadpool, that I wanted to represent in this graph? Well, I could place him in somewhere between John Wick and Beverly Hills Cop. It's funny. There's some action in it. And what you'll notice here is that there is now some sort of a distance between all the points. So I can clearly see that Deadpool very closely aligns with Beverly Hills Cop. There is a small distance between this black dot and this yellow dot, much smaller than the distance between the yellow dot and the brown dot. So I can maybe make a claim here that if someone likes Beverly Hills movie, uh, Beverly Hills Cop, they might also like Deadpool. That might be something that they align with. So we call these two points the nearest neighbors. In this sense, it's the first nearest neighbor because we only have five points and it's the closest. But I hope this explains what distance means. And it seems super simple on a 2D example, but what if we have 100 dimensions or 1000 dimensions? In this case, a dimension is a feature. So in this example, we have two features, comedy and action. However, we can have runtime as a feature. We can have year of release as a feature. We can have hundreds of different types of genres as features. And if we're talking about text, you can see how text can become thousands of features. One blob of text could talk more about medieval times. One blob of text could talk more about nonfiction, historical things. And so there are, it, is, it, it can become very complicated to represent one document, one 
image, one sound into one vector of numbers. So in order to analyze large vectors, we have three black boxes that we need to solve. One is what, what vector embedding algorithms? The second black box is how do you even calculate distances between vectors in such high dimensions? And the third black box is how do you determine which vectors are similar? So for the first black box, we're looking at vector embedding algorithms. So how do you even convert a document, an image, or a sound into a list of numbers in the first place? Well, it's not magic. It's math powered by AI. And the recent improvements in accuracy and accessibility of large language models, LLMs, including BERT and OpenAI, I don't know if you heard of them. They're kind of small. They definitely haven't made an impact in the world yet, <laughs> have made vector embedding extremely accessible and affordable. Now, determining which algorithm to select can be a workshop on its, on its own. So I highly encourage you to check out these models, their models that they already have on their sites and in their documentation. However, generally embedding algorithm selection comes down to two things. What are you trying to optimize in your search and how much resources and time are you willing to spend? In our workshop today, I will be querying movie, uh, creating movie recommendation queries over text. And this text will be descriptions of the movies. So because I want to optimize over a text search, I have chosen to use, to use OpenAI's latest text embedding model, text embedding ADA or ADA 002. And I want to point out the 002 at the end. This is the latest second generation embedding model, which is higher in performance with reduced embedding size, and yet it still has 1,536 elements for each vector. So we are well into the high dimensions here. And now calculating these distances in these high dimensions can get quite complicated, which brings me to the next block, to the next black box. But before I move on, does anyone have any questions so far? Take the silence as a no. If you do, feel free to throw something in the chat. I know we have uh, Julie and John monitoring the chat and helping to answer questions. And I will, of course, answer questions uh, throughout, throughout the presentation. Just feel free to interrupt me. Black box number two, calculating distances. So how do you even calculate the distances between two vectors? Well, let's use a 2D example for now to explain this, but there are two common distance metrics used in vector search. The first one is Euclidean distance. The Euclidean distance measures the straight line distance between two points in a Euclidean space. It is, com is, it is computed as a square root of the sum of the square differences between corresponding coordinates of the vectors. So if I draw your attention down here to the, the blue dot and the purple dot, you'll see that you can just apply Pythagorean's theorem here, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, square root both sides, and that's what we mean by the square root of the sum of the square differences. That's how you calculate this d, this line in between. And the smaller the Euclidean distance between the two vectors, the more similar they are in terms of their features or whatever you have plotted on the x and y axis. Again, this is a 2D example, but this can be expanded to much higher dimensions. Now, the second type of distance metrics that we use is cosine similarity. So cosine similarity measures the cosine of the angle between the two vectors, and it quantifies the similarity of their direction regardless of their magnitudes. So in this case, regardless of how far away the Euclidean, the, in, in this case, the Euclidean distance could be much further away between the teal and the purple. The purple could be all the way, all the way over to the right, but the angle between the two would stay the same. So the cosine similarity is often preferred for text-based vector representation, and that's what I want to note here, because it focuses on the orientation of the vectors rather than the lengths, and that tends to be more optimal whenever you're searching over text. So later on in our demo, we are going to be optimizing over text search, so we are going to be using the cosine similarity to, in order to determine the distances between our vectors. Now, the cosine similarity is a built-in function in Rockset, so you don't have to worry about doing all the math. Now, moving on to the final black box, how to determine which vectors are the most similar. So this is where the term nearest neighbors, like I mentioned before, plays a pivotal role in vector search. It's the closest data points to a given point in high dimensional space. And there are multiple nearest, I mean, thousands of nearest neighbors, nearest neighbors search algorithms to choose from. Here is just a general overview of the most common. So at the top, we have the most simple, and that is a linear search. 
This basic approach involves computing the distance or the cosine similarity between a query vector and all the vectors in the data set. So when I say query vector, query vector is whatever I'm searching for. So if I'm searching for keywords in a movie data set, that is my query vector. All the other vectors in my data set is the IMDB movie data set. And the closest vectors are identified after a linear search as the nearest neighbors. However, this requires us to go through every single row of our collection and to calculate the similarity between the, the query vector and the, the vector in the data set. And you can see how as the data set grows larger and becomes more complicated, this is just too computationally expensive and inefficient. So this really only works for lower dimensions, but it's a great stepping stone onto the next type of um, nearest neighbors algorithm. And that is the ANN, the approximate nearest neighbors algorithm. And there are hundreds of different types of ANN algorithms. This technique is designed to efficiently find the approximate nearest neighbor, and it trades off accuracy, slight accuracy for significantly faster search speeds. By instead of finding the exact nearest neighbor, it finds approximately what you were looking for. And it does this simply by partitioning the data points into subsets or buckets, and then algorithms can quickly filter out irrelevant candidates during the search process. So if, you, if we have movie data, we can already pre-label our data with genre buckets. And so if someone is typing things like clown, killer, scary, we might already know that that is going to go into horror. And if we don't, we know that that's definitely not going into comedy. So that might be a way for us to filter out a big segment of our data and avoid having to make unnecessary cal calculations. Now that is a simple man-made filter if I just filter by genre. But usually we don't like to put too much of our influence into our data, so we have other algorithms that do that. We have two here, I have the KD tree and the locality sensitive hashing. So the KD tree is a hierar 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 that word, data structure that partitions the vector space into regions, and it allows efficient nearest neighbor search by recursively splitting the data points into smaller subsets based on their dimension. So I highly recommend, there's a bunch of YouTube videos on this, and there's a bunch of uh, white papers on this and how you can build your own KD tree. It's very interesting and it's very cool. If you can find a way to split your subset into smaller data sets, it speeds up your search. We also have locality sensitive hashing, LSH. LSH is an algorithmic approach that hashes similar vectors to the same or nearby buckets. So with this hashing, it enables efficient searching by again, reduce, reducing the search space for the nearest neighbors. All right, so that's the theory behind vector search done. And if you've been following me so far, well, then you're gonna love the next section because I know you guys are engineers. Theory is fun and all, but it's the application of engineers that gets engineers excited. So I wanna go move over to five use cases for vector search and answering the question, why do I even need vector search at all? What can I even do with vector search? So use case number one is recommendation systems, which we'll attempt to do a very simplified version of today in our hands-on. We can find similar users or items based on their performances or based on their pre preferences or behaviors. To implement this, we represent users or items as vectors and then calculate similarity using, again, cosine similar, similarity or Euclidean distance, and then identifying the most similar users or items, we can make personalized recommendations. So I'm sure you've seen on Amazon or on Netflix, they'll say something along the lines of, users like you also looked at these items, or viewers like you also watched these movies. That is a vector search. So the implementation here is to build a user item matrix where the rows represent users, and the columns represent items. So the matrix values represents how much each user likes that item. For a movie data that could be represented as watch time or rating, some sort of a metric to determine how much a user enjoys that specific item or item. And then we transform this matrix into a vector space representation using techniques like matrix factorization, TF-IDF, and there's a bunch of other different types of algorithms out there for, for this type of matrix embedding. Then we perform a vector search to find similar users or items for recommendations. That's simple. 
Now, moving on to use case number two is text search and document clustering. So vector search also enables document similarity search. We can find similar documents based on their textual content alone. An implementation here is we'll take documents, represent them as vectors using techniques like TF-IDF, word embedding such as Word2Vec, or document embedding such as Doc2Vec, and then we'll convert a query document. So again, the query document in this sense could be anything like um, a question that you want to ask your docs page. It could be maybe a couple, a couple of keywords that you're looking for a specific site on Google search. We convert that query document, those keywords, into a vector representation, and then perform a vector search to find similar documents. Again, vector search is simply comparing your query vector with your data vector. Now, whether or not you want to do that linearly, you want to go through every single one, or if you want to do approximately, and then we pull out the nearest neighbors. Now, use case number three is image and object recognition. Yep, vector search can be used to find visually similar images just based on their visual features. Anything that can have a feature can be represented as a vector. As a reminder again, dimensions in vectors represent features in your data. So an image has plenty of different types of features. Colors is a feature, contrast is a feature, objects are features in, in images. So that can all be represented as vectors. Images in this implementation, we represent images as vectors using using some sort of a deep learning model, like a convolution neural network, also known as a CNN, that is pre-trained. This is a type of machine learning model to extract relevant feature information from your images. And then when performing an image search, we'll convert the query image into a vector using the same CNN, and then perform vector search to find visually similar images. I hope you guys are catching a pattern here on exactly the steps you'd use to perform a vector search. Finally, four out of five. Use case four to five is music representation. Yep, Spotify is here as well. Vector search can be used to find similar songs or audio based on, again, their acoustic features. So songs here can be represented as vectors using techniques like male frequency, well, male frequency, sexual coefficients, or spectrogram embeddings. We convert the query audio into a vector, perform a vector search on that query audio with the entire data set to find similar songs. And now use case number five, fraud detection. This is our last use case, but there are many other use cases that I'm just pointing out the top five or the most five most common. And that is that vector search can be used for fraud detection. So in this context, each transaction or event can be represented as a vector. We create vector representations for both historical le legitimate transactions and known fraudulent patterns. So when a new transaction occurs, it's a vector representation, its vector representation is, com is computed, and then the vector search is performed to find the most similar vectors from the database. If the new transaction vector aligns closely with a vector that's representing fraudulent patterns, then we raise a red flag, it could potentially be fraud. So I pointed out earlier that I hope you guys can catch some sort of a pattern here, but the pattern here is step one to embed your vectors. Now there's plenty of algorithms depending on your data set. If you're using images, there's algorithms for that. If you're using sound, there's algorithms for that. If you're using text, there's algorithms for that. The second step is to, uh, is to load up everything in a database so that you can query it. The third step here is to create an embedding for your search query. And the final step is to vector search with your search query and your data. So those are the steps that we're gonna follow in our demo. Now, before we move on to the demo, does anyone have any questions? Okay, I'm gonna take that as a no. So I have a GitHub repository that Ashley, if you could be so kind and share in the chat, this GitHub repository has everything that we need to do a hands-on demo today. It's got the data set with the embeddings already done. We're going to ingest it into Rockset. It's going the ingestion will take about five to ten minutes, and we're going to run some queries on it as well and see how vector search runs in real time. All right, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and move over to the demo portion.
Okay. Can everyone see my screen? I should be, we should all be looking at the repository. Now, for anyone that's watching the recording of this and doesn't obviously have access to chat, the repository can be found on github.com slash Sophia 099 slash vector underscore search underscore demo. And it's a public repository, so anyone can access it and it'll stay public uh, for as long as I'm alive because I don't ever plan on deleting it. So this vector search demo is going to help us do an introductory vector search in real time using both OpenAI and Rockset. So at this point, I do want to make sure that everyone has both an OpenAI account and a Rockset account. If you don't have a Rockset account, please click this link here to create one. For those who don't have one or for those who are watching the recording and don't have one, just letting you know that you can create a free Rockset trial. You will have $300 in credits when you start off. And afterwards, if you don't want to pay, that's okay. You can continue using Rockset for free. The API keys are available on the free version of Rockset. So please go create an account if you don't have one yet. If you don't have an open AI account, you'll also need to create an open AI account. So please click here. All you need to do is create a username and password, and then just go into your settings and generate an API key. It should only take a few, a few minutes. We'll need an API key for both Rockset and an API key for OpenAI. OpenAI, again, the free version allows you to use the API keys and you will be able to embed on the free version. If you would like to embed thousands and thousands of documents, you may have to put in your credit card and pay as you go, but I already did that part for you. So don't worry about that. So I want to give everyone a little bit of time to create their OpenAI account and their Rockset account. So while people do that, um, does anyone have any questions? Otherwise, I'm just going to briefly talk over the data. It's not that not not too, not too important if you're grabbing your OpenAI account and Rockset account. Okay. Yeah. So if you just want to call out that, you know, OpenAI was just kind of an easy uh, API for us to access and, and use for this workshop, but there are a lot of other kind of providers of these types of functionalities when it comes to especially creating embeddings from text. Um, there are other <clears throat> kind of larger independent companies like OpenAI, um, but there are also a lot of open source options where you can actually <clears throat> run these models locally or on your own cloud deployment uh, to actually generate those embeddings. And so the process really comes down to ease of use versus cost. Uh, and also there's performance trade-offs as well with all those considerations. Yeah, thank you so much for mentioning that. That is a very good point. There, there are many different ways to create embeddings. So we use, uh, we create embeddings via OpenAI in this example here. But like John said, there's many different other applications out there, open source ones that well that are completely free. So there's a lot of, a lot of resources out there available making vector search extremely easily accessible, affordable, and that's why you see such a spike in that terminology recently in the news. All right, so I'm gonna quickly talk over the data collection a bit. So this vector search demo will be over IMDB movie titles and descriptions. I have the unembedded data set link. It's, I got it from Kaggle and the link is here in my readme. I've already gone ahead and embedded the data set using the text embedding ADA002 model from OpenAI. And I have put that, it is in a public AWS S3 bucket. So you don't have to worry about embedding it today. It did take about 24 hours to fully embed on my, on my um, slow internet, but it's definitely, OpenAI is a great resource for embedding. Um, there is some rate limiting that you have to take into account, which can always slow things down. Like John said, there's other open source options available that might not have a rate limiting. You can always explore those options. But in this case, you don't have to worry about embedding. I already did that for you. We will be embedding the search queries together. So any searches that we do on this movie data set, such as searching for keywords, maybe searching for a specific movie, that is going to be, uh, we are going to be embedding that together today. Okay. I hope hopefully everyone has created an open AI account so far. Um, and I'm hoping everyone has a Rockset account. I will go briefly over step one. So step one uh, is you don't have we don't have to do today. This is embedding vectors using open AI's API. I want to go over this to explain how I did it. So if you want to embed your own data, you can follow the same steps and at least understand what the steps are. Again, we don't have to do step one today because I already embedded the data 
previously to this uh, workshop. So the first thing I did was I extracted the large data set into smaller data sets. And then I sent API requests to the open AI's embedding endpoint. As I mentioned before, I use the text embedding ADA002 model and they have other models. So I recommend you read their docs. For the IMDB movie data set, I chose to embed the movie name and the description fields. So I concatenated the movie name and description fields and then embedded that entire string. And that vector embedding, which is again, 1,536 elements, I appended at the end of each row. So the original doc, the original collection had, I think about 11, 12 fields. And I just added an extra field at the end called embedding. And that includes the vector representation of the movie name and the description. It's actually a pretty simple step. Um, and the files, the Python files that I have for this are the extract subsets Python file, just in case um, you didn't know how to do that. And the vector embedding Python file here. So you'll have to replace it with your own API key. And all the steps are here if, in case you want to follow it right along. And I have some exceptions for rate limiting errors as well. All right. Well, I mean, I would love to go right ahead and get started and upload this data to Rockset. Um, I don't know if I should ask for a emoji or something from everyone to make sure that everyone's ready. If you'd like to follow along, I really encourage you to. It, it won't take too long. I promise. It'll be fun. Yeah, and, and just to call here too, Sophia um, did something interesting where she actually concatenated the text before embedding it. Um, but depending um, on you know your text and how you want to kind of aggregate data, you could actually do that after creating the embeddings as well. So in theory, you could embed the title, you can embed the description, and then actually add those separately uh, to kind of show the kind of combination of the information um, that's carried by each of those blocks of text. So there's a lot of different design patterns um, that you can use for that. And it really just comes down to the performance that you may need and pro also probably require some testing based off of your use case. Thank you for mentioning that, John. And actually, and yes, I do want to add that I am only embedding the movie titles and descriptions, but there are many other different types of features that I'm not embedding in this example here. I am not taking into account the specific genre, the year, the release date, the gross profit, but those are all features that you can implement in whatever model that you are creating. So for now, step two, uploading data to Rockset. This won't take too long. Um, if you have your own, um, if you have your own data set with embeddings and you would like to embed that, I encourage you to do that today. Or you can follow along with me and embed this movie data set, and then we can do some queries on this movie, movie data set today. So the first step is to go into your Rockset console onto the collections tab. So all the steps are listed here. I'm not going to focus too much on this screen. I'm just going to go straight to the console because I know a lot of you guys are visual learners. So the first step is to go to the collections tab in your console and then click create a collection in the upper right corner. You'll then want to click Amazon S3 and then click the public bucket. So this should be available on every um, every Rockset org, even the new trial users. Then when you're in this page, you want to select your file format to be CSV. This um, in my S3 bucket, everything saved as a CSV. Then you want to go back to the readme and copy this public S3 URL. Go back to the console and paste this right here. Perfect. And the source preview should work. If the source preview doesn't work, uh, refresh your page, try again. Um, if it doesn't work, please feel free to say something now, like, hey, it doesn't work for me. Well, it should work though. All right, so moving on to the next section. So the next section is your ingest transformation. For those who don't know, this is a query that you apply on any new coming data before it is stored in Rockset. So this is great for pre-processing your data and making sure you remove any duplicates, any bad data, clean up your input a bit, set some sort of standardization across your naming. That's what this ingest transformation query editor is for. Now, regardless of what data set you are using, it is very important that you use a vector enforce function here. So let me copy over the ingest transformation that I have for this collection. I already included in the readme file. So all you'll need to do is copy this and paste here. 
And this ingest transformation may look a little complicated, but it's just me cleaning up the data, converting some strings into integers, some array, some strings into arrays. But at the very bottom here, I have this function vector enforce. Now, this is a very important function whenever you're doing a vector, a vector search. So you want to apply the vector enforce onto whatever embedding column you have. What this does is it enforces the same length, vector length and the same vector type for every single vector in your collection. And this will ensure that your data is compacted properly so that searching through the vectors is as quick as possible and saves run saves a lot of time during core execution. So one, go ahead, John. Yeah, and, and so I just want to call out as well. Um, so in Rockset, when we ingest arrays, we actually typically index every single element of that array. Um, usually we have arrays of text or kind of other types of objects that actually require us to index those individual fields. But since uh, a vector or an embedding really has you know, the majority of its value across the sum or across all the different elements of the array, vector enforce actually gives us the signal that this is a unique type of array, this is embedding, this is a vector. And so we actually won't index every single individual element of that array. Um, and this has large implications, especially in terms of the storage requirements and needs. And this actually really helps greatly reduce the amount of storage that's required to, to store embeddings within Rockset. Thank you. Thank you for explaining that, John. Yep. Uh, everything he said is correct. And it helps speed up the entire process to make sure that this is as real time as possible, because that's the key here. That is why we're using Rockset. We want to make sure that we can run these searches as fast as possible. So the next step, um, once you click next, is going to be just um, adding a name. So a workspace name and a collection name. If you want to follow along with me, I'm going to save this in my movies workspace. And my collection name, I will set it to IMDB Movies. I'll set it to version three. I think I already have a version two up. All right. Um, now, before you click Create, if you are a trial user on the bottom of your screen, you will see a prompt asking you to switch over to a dedicated VI, specifically a dedicated medium VI. And if you are not a trial user, I want you to think about which VI you're already in. So your VI, you can always view by going into your virtual instance tab. Now, a virtual instance is just a compute unit that we use here at Rockset. And a dedicated virtual instance just means that your ingestion will be on a cluster that only you are using and you're not sharing with anyone else. So this will ensure the highest performance and allow you to ingest your to ingest all of this data as quick as possible. So if you are currently on, a, on anything below a small, I recommend that you switch over to at least a small virtual instance, ideally a medium. That will make sure that you have the fastest ingest possible. You can always drop your VI back down. Uh, for virtual instances, you are charged based on how long you stay on the virtual instance. So in this case, I expect this to ingest in six to 10 minutes which won't cost that much. And if you are a trial user, you do have $300 worth of credits that you have to use up within two weeks, and that will definitely cover the cost of that. So I highly recommend you switch over your virtual instance to at least a smaller medium before you ingest this data. Okay, so I'm going to ingest this by clicking Create. All right, perfect. And it's going to take um, a bit of time to ingest. So it, in this case, it is going to bulk ingest, which is what we want. Bulk ingest is the fastest way to ingest into Rockset, and it is triggered based on the size of your data and based on what VI you are currently using. Perfect. Bulk ingest is in progress. Awesome. So when the final data set is ingested, it will be about 243,000 documents, a total of 8.2 gigabytes of data. Now, I do want to point out that the vectors are 1,536 elements each. So that will add a lot of storage. When you have, when you do your own vector embedding, you will, it's normal to see your storage um, size spike up after the embedding is done. So that's just a FYI, um, you, that is normal. Okay, now we have some time to kill. So if anyone has any questions and they've been saving them up till this moment, now is your time to, now is the time to ask. Um, again, if you have any questions that you just don't want to ask during this recorded session, you can always reach our support team by clicking this need help button and clicking live chat support. We always have someone on live chat um, and we have 
uh, support ticket. So feel free to use a support ticket for any support related any support related needs, such as you can ask any type of inquiries or help or advice suggestions on how to do vector search at Rockset or anything else you want to do at Rockset. Feel free to contact us. We also have a community page where you can post um, questions for the community, and then we always have a request demo option if you want to have an engineer help you demo something. All right, so I um, do would like, you know, John, if there's anything else, anything you'd like to discuss on what's the future for vector search, now would be a great time to discuss. Yeah, so so we have a ton of fun things uh, in the pipeline. This is a very active area <clears throat> of development for us. Um, and so we want to make sure that this is uh, a true kind of first class experience within Rockset. So some of the things that we have coming in, in the short term and in the short term, we can kind of say probably within the next month or so um, are actually a lot of optimizations to actually improve uh, the vector search performance and execution of the vector search algorithm um, within Rockset, uh, leveraging Rockset's indices. And so there's a few different categories in which we can improve performance. Um, one is embeddings, vectors. It's a really unique type of, of array kind of within Rockset. And since we know these embeddings will be of kind of similar same lengths, of similar same types, um, we can actually do very clever things to actually store these homogeneous arrays uh, more efficiently and actually run computation over them more efficiently. Um, so one of this is this kind of idea of vectorization, where you're actually able uh, to run a lot of different computational processes um, at once, as opposed to kind of linearly or kind of sequencing those uh, in that computation. Um, and then the next is actually kind of this idea of kind of inline arrays and inline storage that not only enable you to consolidate computation, let's say across one vector to another, but actually across multiple vectors. Um, so it can really speed up, especially uh, the canon search kind of within Rockset. Um, some other things that we're investing in as well are compatibility with the ecosystem. Um, so one of the kind of most popular packages, libraries, kind of requests that we've heard from customers and incoming prospects is actually around this package called Langchain. Um, and Langchain has kind of become the de facto kind of package library for building LLM powered applications. And so with our upcoming integration, which actually should be merged upstream with the open source repo within the next week or so here, um, you actually be able to very easily use Rockset as your vector database um, that would underlie and support a lot of the functionality that you have uh, within Langchain. Um, so we have that coming as well. And then we're also doing some kind of interesting explorations um, to really improve the embedding kind of creation process. And so we're still at early stages there. We kind of see in the, in the short term, though, maybe being able to, let's say, reduce that additional step of calling out to open AI and, let's say, building a separate uh, kind of orchestration layer to either em em create your embeddings in real time or also embed your search, um, where you can actually kind of do that kind of within Rockset. Um, and then even further down the road, we actually think of composting models within Rockset. Um, so I think there's some kind of really exciting things there in terms of just facilitating that embedding generation process, but also bringing the inference of the models actually much closer to the data, which can reduce a lot of kind of network latency that can arise when you have multiple different systems that are trying to communicate uh, and execute and offer kind of a real-time experience to your users. And then the really exciting things that are coming um, are really around ANN support. So the workshop today is focused on KNN, which is this exact nearest neighbor search. But our next big release will really be around ANN support, which will be for approximate nearest neighbors uh, searches. And ANN kind of historically um, has been something um, kind of the indices required to support an ANN search and also the algorithms that are run across those indices um, are really hard to kind of facilitate or manage with a <clears throat> metadata that may enable you to filter across that ANN search um, and also updates. Um, and so one of the really exciting things that we have coming is not only ANN support, but ANN support with the same mutability and real-time updates that you get with Rockset. Um, in addition to having your metadata as a, a first-class citizen alongside these embeddings, so you can leverage you know, any type and number of filters 
um, to actually help dictate that ANN search. And then, you know, things get even more exciting because you could, you could have an ANN index and you have your KNN index kind of side by side. And we can actually use our kind of query execution engine, our cost-based optimizer uh, to actually determine which of those searches will be the most efficient based off of the filters, based off of the distribution and profile of your data. Um, and so that's kind of where we're headed, I would say, in, in the medium term. And then longer term, you know, there's a lot of additional things we can do in terms of performance, in terms of supporting different types of in and algorithms, uh, in terms of kind of model hosting, embedding generation. Um, and so, you know, we're at a stage where we're, we're learning a ton from you all and from our customers, um, but we still see that as a very, you know, exciting area for, for long-term investment as well. And I do want to point out something uh, John mentioned about in inline column array updates to speed up the query time. So that's currently in our staging and I've been work looking at it with our engineers and I've seen 10 X improvement in our runtime. So that should be released very soon. Again, we're currently in a beta release for our vector search. So we expect a lot of improvements in the next month or so. And as John mentioned, we're going to have ANN support very soon as well. We're working on that. And there's, there's a lot of things coming for, for vector search in Rockset. It is a, and, He'll, uh, as John also mentioned, we are learning a lot from our customers. So feel free to also reach out to the support ticket with requests or ideas you have or things, your use cases. And we'll take that into consideration as we're developing the next the next uh, phase of vector search. Yeah, and I'll actually, I'll drop my email in the chat as well. Like uh, if you all have any feedback, questions, things that we don't support or yeah, you can see us supporting, definitely reach out, let me know I'm very accessible and definitely want to make sure that we're making you know, all of our customers uh, and users as accessible as possible, especially in kind of this brave new world um, of embeddings and, and vector search. Thank you. So I'm, I just quickly looked into my collection that's been ingesting and it's currently in the indexing phase. So hopefully everyone else is also in the provisioning and indexing phase. It occurred to me, so it's only been eight minutes, but it occurred to me it might take a little bit of time since we're all trying to download from the same S3 bucket. Uh, so I might just take a little bit extra time. Uh, but there's there, there's not that many people on this call, so so we'll be okay. I mean, actually, there now that I look at it, there's actually quite a, wow, thank you guys. Thank you for showing up. I appreciate it. It's always, and thank you to everyone who has their camera on. It's always nice to be talking to faces. Don't worry, I appreciate the names as well. I appreciate everyone that's here. Your presence, I can sense it all. So I'm going to take a little bit of time to explain that. Yeah, you know, we do have a question in the chat that I wanted to bring up. Leon asked, um, "Can you, Arch um, John, can you please introduce any architecture changes to Rockset that we're having to support vector search?" You want to take that question? And you're muted, by the way, John. Yeah. So, so within Rockset, we actually already support uh, a number of different indices. Um, so if you look at any of our materials and also kind of our architecture diagrams that are available um, on our site, um, we have this concept of a converged index, which is actually using uh, and blending <clears throat> a variety of indexes um, to efficiently search across different types of query patterns. And so when we think about ANN support uh, and KNN support as well, um, it actually in, in some ways is just adding an additional index uh, to our, our kind of current architecture. Uh, and turn infrastructure. And so we actually don't need a separate index for k &N types of searches, but we will need that for a &N. And so we can really just see this as an additional index. And we're now thinking through the ergonomics just because today we'll create kind of a set number of indices for all collections that are created. But this would be something that you'd only need for specific types of collections, right? And those are collections with embeddings and uh, collections that you wanna run vector search over. And so then with that, there'll be additional kind of ergonomics that will enable you to actually create those indices after collection creation or during the collection creation process um, to actually power uh, an ANN style search. Thank you, John. Are there any other questions in the chat, Julie, that you think are interesting? I, I really appreciate um, you and, and John monitoring the QA. That's our first one to, to come in. If you do have other questions, please feel free to ask. Um, we'd love to make sure that this is a beneficial workshop for you. Thanks. And if you have any questions after the fact, I know I usually do. It's always takes it's always that shower question that you have when you're in the shower and you're thinking, oh, I should ask that. Again, you can always reach out on our support team via the a live chat or the support ticket. So my 
bulk ingest is completed. It took 10 minutes to ingest 8.2 gigabytes of data and index everything and apply the ingest transformation to every document. In case yours hasn't, don't worry, you still have some time before actually running any queries. I'm gonna take some time to explain the Python script that I've written to do a KNN vector search. So I'm going to share my screen again. Okay, so the first thing I wanna point out is that I labeled my IMDB movies data set with a version three. Um, this is, tends to be good practice whenever you're building collections to version it out. And then when you call a collection, you want to use something called an alias. So if you don't, if you're not familiar with an alias is, an alias is essentially like a pointer to whatever collection you have. So I can create an alias called IMDB movies, and that alias will point to whatever version of the collection that I'm using currently. This makes versioning out really easy. I can write all my queries using the alias IMDB movies. And then if I decide to change my collection to a different version, all I have to do is change the pointer to point to the newest version of the collection instead of going through all of my queries and changing every V3 into V4. It's too much work. So in case you don't know how to create an alias, go into collections, click alias, and you can click create an alias. I already have one created, so I'm just going to go to my IMDb movies alias. It is currently pointing at version one right now, so I'm going to update the collection reference and I'm going to point it to my version three. I guess I didn't have a version two. I might have deleted it. All right, so now my alias has been updated or is updating. Let me refresh my page. Oh. One moment, please. There it is. It is up pointing now to the newest version, IMDb Movies 3. So now back to the GitHub repository. The one Python file that you do need is the vector search file here. And so I recommend that you get this opened up in whatever IDE that you use locally. I am currently using Visual Studios and you will need to replace your open AI API key and your Roxet API key. I obviously don't have it displayed because I don't want to share that information with the world. I've hidden it in a text file, but just drop in whatever API key you have here. So I'll give you guys some time to do that now while I talk over what this code is doing. You will also need to update the host URL. So the host URL is related to your region that your Rockset cluster is hosted on. So in my case, I'm using the West region. To find which URL you should use, please go to this link here. And that link takes you right here to the Roxa API reference. So for we have three regions. For each region, we have a different base URL. If you don't know which region you're in, in your console, if you look at the upper right or upper left, if you click this drop down, it'll tell you if you're in the West, East, or Central. So I'm currently in the West region, which is why I'm using the West base URL. So that will need to be updated. Go back to my Python file. All right, so the next thing that you can update here is our search query. So this is that the, the search query I was talking about earlier in the presentation. This is what you're searching for in the data. So in this case, I'm looking for movies about medieval things, knights, castles, dragons. I can throw a bunch of information here, relevant or irrelevant. Um, the longer your search query is, it will put more weight on any, any words that are more closely associated. So if I have, if I throw in something that's not really related, it won't weight that as much. Then I, op I initialize a Rockset client. I embed the search query right here. So I embed the search query with OpenAI, again, using this model. I convert that embedded search query into a string so that I can pass it as a query in my Rockset client right here. So in this query, I have select the movie name from movies.imdbmovies. So movies is my workspace. If you use a different workspace, you'll have to change that. Commons is the default workspace, if you don't remember. And then IMDB movies is your collection name or your reference name. In this case, I am applying a metadata filtering. So my, my filter here is I'm looking over any movies in the history genre. And then I am ordering by the cosine similarity between the embeddings. These are all the embeddings that I already did ahead of time. This is a field in IMDB movies. So a cosine similarity between the embeddings and the embedding string, the search query embedding. 
And I'm or ordering by this cosine similarity in descending order and limiting to only the top five. So this simple query is your KNN query. This is going to pull the five nearest neighbors using a linear search cosine um, with cosine similarity as the distance metrics. I am applying some sort of a filter to kind of simulate an approximate, uh, a, a, some sort of an approx approximation since I'm assuming that I'm using, I'm looking at history data. And so let me run this now and we can see there it is. So the movies that I'm displaying here is Kingdom of Swords, Ironclad. The rest of these all look medieval to me. So it looks like it worked. And we can change this to be any search query. So if anyone has any suggestions, feel free to speak up. Um, otherwise, you know, feel free to play around, play around with it, see how what the limits are here. And with the meta filtering, it is much faster. I do want to show what it looks like without the meta filtering. So if I wanted to search over this search query over all of my IMDb movies, again, this is a 8.2 gigabyte file. So if I remove this meta filtering, so now this is a simple linear search. There is no filtering. I'm going through every single row and it is going to take some time. As I mentioned before, linear search is not as efficient for higher dimensional data, for larger data. This is primarily just to showcase how linear search can work, or sorry, just to showcase how nearest neighbors can work. And you can apply it to smaller filter data, but it is still possible. Um, it takes me about 15 seconds to be able to pull this information. Um, I'm on Zoom now, so it might take, oh, there it is. Oh, I think that was a little bit faster. Uh, the Sword and the Dragon, The Young Dragon, St. George and the Dragon. So it looks like there's some extra movies in here that wasn't in the previous. Um, these movies must have not been labeled with the history genre. So that's something else that's important to know is that your results will vary dramatically on the quality of your data. And that is the burden of every single data scientist ever. So good luck on, on that journey. But if you need any help, feel, I feel free to reach out. Yeah, and uh, just to add some more color too, I think on the kind of linear search and kind of K&N trade-offs, um, especially with the kind of optimizations we have coming in the next couple of weeks, you know, K&N search can still scale to, you know, hundreds of thousands of embeddings. Obviously the length uh, and the dimensions of that embedding can impact that as well, um, but you actually still can support a very large volume of embeddings. Um, and then also too, whenever you're using filtering, right, this naturally kind of actually lends to more of a K&N approach and especially if those filters are selective, right? You could have a data set with millions of vectors, uh, but based on your filters, you actually may only want to search across, you know, several thousand of those. And so that's actually another use case where KNN will actually be much more effective than something like ANN, assuming the filtering restrictions that you have with kind of the standard ANN options that are available today in other systems. Thank you, John. You also have segmented. Oh, I was going to just say, we also had a question that came in through chat. Um... From the earlier explanation, collections that were ingested with tokenization need to be re-ingested in order to use the current and upcoming nearest neighbors functionality. Is that correct? Yes. So once these optimizations are released, um, they actually have to do with how we're internally storing data within Rockset. And that is pretty much established during the collection creation process. So once those and these new enhancements are shipped, you would need to recreate those collections to take advantage of the kind of performance improvements. And John, do you know how we're communicating this? Should we Are we sending out some sort of an email when, when this is rolled out to encourage? Yes, um, I, I'm sure this will probably be in our kind of monthly product update um, and, and release email. Um, so we can keep everyone kind of up to date there. Um, also, too, for attendees of the, of the workshop, customers that we know are already kind of exploring or using vector search, we could also send out um, individual uh, comps as well. So, yeah, we, we, we should huddle and figure out what our, our best options are there, but definitely want to communicate that uh, to everyone interested in this space. And if you do want to be notified of this, feel free to just drop your email in chat. I will take a note of it all and I can send you guys an email when these things are rolled out because I know I'll be using it um, for my for my personal projects as well. So uh, the next, let's see, where else? All right, the next step I wanted to showcase was a very simple personalized recommend movie recommendations. So I'm going to draw your attention back to the console. I'm gonna go into my query editor. And in my query editor, I've selected five movies that I have 
I, that I've recently watched. So I'm a big musical fan and I also like horror movies. So fun fact, there are musicals that are horror movies. It's very fun, very entertaining to see people scared and singing at the same time. So I've pulled five musical horror movies that I've recently watched and I'm going to pretend that this is my watch list. So I'm going to create a movie recommendation with vector search based on my watch list. So in this case, I have taken the movie ID from these five movies. In this next query, I am essentially just pulling the I'm just pulling the string of all the movie titles and the movie descriptions into one large string. So if I run this, you'll see that I have all the movies followed by all of the one sentence descriptions. And these descriptions, by the way, oh, let me hide my meeting control so I can see my terms. Um, these movie descriptions, if you go into IMDb, they're these one sentence movie descriptions. So they're not very thorough. Um, again, this is one of those, this is one of the things that data scientists are burdened with, and that is the quality of your data will affect the quality of your results. So in this case, my IMDb movie data was just using this one, uh, for most cases, one or two sentence descriptions. So that's something else to note when you're querying through this data. But I can copy over all of this, in all, this entire string of the movies I've watched and their descriptions, and I can go back into my script and I can paste this in my search query. And then in my SQL here that I send, I wanna make sure that I don't copy over these IDs. So I'm going to copy this word clause. Essentially, I want to ensure that I'm not going to return the movies that I've already watched and where ID is not in this. All right. All right. So I'm not going to apply any meta, meta filtering, but in many cases, I would probably apply some sort of meta filtering. In this case, there could be another model that you could use to clearly indicate that I like musicals and that could be your first meta filter. As this is running, I do want to explain something called segmented filtering. So segmented filtering is essentially where the in order to get as real time results as possible, the first few data sets. Oh, wow, that was oh, it's already there. Uh, the zombified music, movie musical, Theater of the Dead, Vampire Birth Serenade. Yep, these all look like movies that I would like to watch. They seem musical, funny, but also somehow related to horror movies. So it's cool. It, it worked. And so what I was saying earlier is you can apply some sort of a filter to your initial search. So while you have your longer search running, you can have another query running that has a filter. So that filter could be top rated movies. So first, if I'm searching for Let's say the medieval example, when I'm looking for medieval and knights and King Arthur, whatever I'm looking for, I can actually run two queries. The first query has a metadata filter, and that metadata filter could be top 1,000 movies based on gross profit or ratings. And then the second query won't have any metadata, metadata filtering, and it'll query over the entire data set. That way, the first filter that's showing the top 1,000 movies, I can display that on my screen right away since that will be very quick and then by the time the user clicks the next page to view the rest of the searches the rest of the queries will have come the rest of the data will have come in from the second query so that's something else we can do now in this personalized movie recommendations i do want to point out this is a very simple you know based on your watch list what you would like as i mentioned before many times movie recommendations are actually based on how well you represent yourself, how well you align yourself with other users. So I mentioned this before, uh, recommendations are usually done with a matrix where the rows are users and the columns are items. And each matrix element is uh, some sort of value that represents how much each user likes that item. And you'll apply a vector search on the user. So you'll compare the users with other users in that matrix and see how you closely align. You'll find the five nearest users closest to you, and then you'll recommend the movies that those users also like. So that's usually how recommendations are done, but this is also a simple way to, to get started with the recommendations as well. All right, does anyone have any questions? Because that will conclude the demo portion. 
And again, all this information, all these files, all these queries, they are located in my repository, as well as some other links to blogs, links to videos. The link to this recording will also be in that repository. So if I go into the README, at the very end, um, I will have a link here. Once this uh, recording is done, I'll paste it in here so that if you ever need to reference the information said here, you can always go back to that. Otherwise, um, I hope that everyone enjoyed this session. At the end of the day, my goal here was to inspire. Hopefully you feel a bit inspired to think about how you can apply vector search onto your own workflow and pipelines. And that's what the point of this was, to get those uh, cogs moving, get the creativity juices flowing. There is a lot of research that needs to be done here before you start implementing vector search. Rockset is a great real-time engine, but there is a lot of pre-processing of data, data collection. As I mentioned before, the quality of your data going into Rockset will highly affect the quality of results. Cleaning up your data, making sure you select the right data, thinking about exactly which features you want to highlight, deciding which algorithms are best to highlight those features. Those are all things that will require a lot of preparation beforehand. And I highly encourage everyone, you know, I have a lot of experience working in ML. And one thing I've learned the hard way is that it's take, uh, taking more time to prepare your data and to really think about how you want to represent your data will save you so many headaches down the road. So feel free to take your time, do your research. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions. I'm always, always happy to help and offer advice where I can. John, is there anything that you wanted to close with? No, nothing else on my end, but we're really excited about Vector Search at Rockset. If you have any questions, comments, feedback, do not hesitate to reach out. We're here to help you and make you all successful. So excited to see what you all build and, and what the next chapter of this looks like. Awesome. Well, perfect. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, looks like we just went four minutes over the hour. So hope, uh, I apologize for that. Enjoy the rest of your day. Take care and see you on the support side.